you know, change management came out of the organization development field. And it morphed into this parallel relationship with the project management field. And where it's going, I think we have to take a water, wider view, view to add business strategy, marketplace changes, leader development, and other things to really understand the future. So where we came from, our roots were out of a very values-based um, industry that never really got its feet under it um, solidly, and that's organization development. We have lots of organization development practitioners across the world, probably many of them here. But as a field, as a values-based field, it was v way ahead of its time in terms of where organizational leaders were. And then we went through the re-engineering stage and started to really get oriented to these large, very expensive IT implementations. And OD was not supporting it adequately. And so all of a sudden we had a more granulated orientation to how we handle people, the people side of the equation of IT implementations. And we had project management driving action on the ground, and then all of a sudden we started to have these, well, what about the people? And change management <clears throat> began to evolve out of that question. And where it met project management was an orientation to more practical tools, more practical uh, ways of approaching behavior, um, dealing with resistance, communication, training. Those were the, and implementation planning, those were the stall marks of change management 20 years ago. By the way, they still are today. And where the field is, I believe, is that we're really fleshing out tools and methods and what we do with software and um, how we really kind of make it alive on the ground. But where the field needs to go is to lift back up. And change management is a fantastic contribution to organizations. But given the complex world that we live in, most of our changes that are really challenging are now transformational. They're no longer just developmental or transitional, where change management thrives. They're transformational. And change management, when we apply it to transformation, it's useful but partial. It's insufficient. And what needs to happen to the field is to grow to a wider worldview, where we begin to talk about leaders and how we develop leaders, how we help them understand their mindsets, how their mindsets are actually causative to how they interpret the world and make decisions and plan for change and sponsor change and launch change, et cetera. We need to address culture. So we need to address the interior aspects of the human dynamic, not just what we do, but how we be. And to do that, we as a field, if we want to stay abreast of the challenges that our leaders are facing, since they're our, they're our main clients, is we've got to expand our worldview to reach out to the cutting edge of leader development. We've got to, yes, include project management and do all the integration work that is now happening on the ground. But we also have to raise up to actually serve directly the C-suite and have partnership with the C-suite, not be an add-on to a change effort. And we've got to also raise up and actually understand business strategy and how do we become an advisor to the business from a strategic level. Now, when I say those last number of things, probably some of us in the room go, oh my God, that's a big task. And that's the point. It is a big task. And we as a field can even either stay in parallel to project management and work our integration and try to get more involved upstream and change projects, or we can raise the quality of our thinking in this field and expand our breadth. And I think that's a choice that we're, in, that we're at. You know, we are adolescents, Daryl, and now I get to be a grown-up soon, and I get to say, how do I want to play in the world? <clears throat> and I think that's exactly where the field is. I think we're at a place where we're, we need to discover and decide collectively how we want to play in the world. The who we are question. This is an important one to me because it's been the basis of my practice for 40 years, so I love this, that we're in this conversation. Um, it, it's an interesting distinction between what we do and who we be. And for us, you know, putting your being first means bringing who you are first. So that's always the foundation. And if we just take that idea, bringing the core of who I am out into my work so that I'm actually using self as an instrument, which is an old OD term, that's what that meant. Using my inner self, my whole self, my authentic self as an instrument of interaction. As Gerard was saying yesterday, that whole beautiful orientation to relationship comes out of how I show up with the other, what's my level of listening, what's my level of authentic truth-telling, what's my level of seeing what the client doesn't see. Can I see what the client doesn't see? Because the client's only asking us for help when they're in chaos. 
at a strategic level. They might be asking to get something done on the ground, but that's, that's different than what we're talking about here. To be a real advisor, we're helping them see what they don't see. And what gets interesting when I look at the, tying this back to the question about where's the, the profession going, we're, we're as, a, as individuals, we're all at different levels of our professional and personal development. As a profession, we're trying to stabilize the base. We're creating standards. We're trying to be real in the world, which is awesome. But there's individuals in this room that are all over the map, higher or lower, in terms of our development as people and as professions. Where we go as people is where we're going to go as a profession. And where we go as we develop ourselves as human beings is we evolve our awareness fundamentally. And we know now um, that adults keep developing their level of awareness. And Piaget and Erickson were the first to discover this with kids. Two-year-olds are different than six-year-olds, different than 10-year-olds, different than 14-year-olds across cultures. But we don't start growing at 18 or 20 in our awareness. 80% of the people do in the world, what research shows. But about 20% of us actually turn inward and start doing things like asking the big questions, who am I? What am I about? How do I show up? What are my behavior styles, et cetera? Start meditating, doing those inner practices. What happens when adults do those inner practices is their worldview expands. So I'm going to track with people individually and this profession we call change management. As we grow, we see across space and time with more breadth. So we have more systems thinking, we can see interdependencies, et cetera, and we have more process thinking. We have a longer horizon. So it's not a month project, a three-month project, it's a year, it's a five-year project. And we also see more deeper into the human dynamic. Not just behavior is what I do, which is what change management's oriented to right now, and not just IQ, but EQ. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> not just EQ, but, sorry, just one of those things. <laughs> You guys want to dance? We can. All right. So not just behavior and EQ and IQ, but going deeper into belief systems and values and worldview and level of awareness. And so what happens is, is we begin to see things connected and we understand the human at a deeper level because we're our own laboratory understanding ourselves. So what's that mean for the profession? The profession will integrate more with project management. That's a given. Because as time goes on, project managers and change managers will see that need, and we're seeing that by the research in the last five years. We will integrate with leadership development. Why? Because we have to. Because when we have a question out in the board that says, how do I get my resistant sponsor on board? You gotta go deal with the person's mindset. Not their behavior, their mindset. And you can't tell a CEO, I don't know if you've ever tried this, would you change your mind? It just doesn't fly doesn't work. So somehow we've got to get inside the leadership development world and begin to help people evolve their mindset from the inside out. That's the only way it happens. We will integrate with strategy because we can do really great stuff in change management, not align to strategy, and have it be worthless. And so what will happen over time is these fields will start to morph and integrate. That's a given because our awareness will start to see they need to. And fundamentally, then, what we will do is we will become co-creators with change, which is different than exchange. Change is developmental. Change makes things better. And it makes it better at a developmental level, a transitional level, a transformational level. How radical is the change? And when it's purely transformational, it means people have to change from the inside out. The individual mindset has to shift. The culture has to shift. So when we talk about how we show up, how we show up is actually core to the development of ourselves as individuals and the development of our field, the development of our planet. We can't solve today's problems from the old way we thought. So fundamentally, yes, it builds relationships, but it's also a platform for breakthrough personally, organizationally, and in our field. And I have passion about that. Did you notice that? <laughs> One client total command and control organization. New CEO, not dissimilar to Gerard, new CEO. D whole different worldview. What's your worldview? Oh, it's all about relationship, all about connection, about people working together, about people working cross-boundary, 
that's a different world than worldview then it's about the leader making the decision only disseminating information to the people that need to know keep it within the boundaries of the uh, of the silo etc this guy was all about cross boundary connection four years later it's a different planet those people live in a different planet right so that worldview made a difference another story was we were doing a four day retreat once years ago and in the closing, me summarizing the closing ahas, the CEO pops out of his chair like a little kid in a candy store. And he says, I get it. I get it. I'm in the way. <laughs> and his whole team went, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, well, that's the point is that was a blending of change with leader development, right? So for us in our own business, we do both for that very reason, because you can't tell those smart CEOs to be different, but you can evoke it from them so they see it. And that's that blending I think is going to happen naturally in these fields. When you're dealing with transformational change from our perspectives, you have to deal with leadership mindset. And the only way you do that is in some kind of retreat setting where you structure experiences for them to, to see the difference between that and so that they can have those ahas. And one of the things that I would throw out from an individual development perspective is that any of us in the audience that aspire to have that kind of trusted advisor role with the C-suite where they're calling you for personal advice about their ideas around strategy execution and change and transformation is to remember that they'll never, we'll never have that relationship through our tools. They don't care. They just want the resistance to go down, the commitment to go up, and things to be delivered as on time and on budget as possible. And for there to be adoption and sustainable results, that's what they care about. And where, what we, if, we, if we can realize that there's these three or four dimensions that we can grow into, which is to see across space more, so see more of the system dynamics in the whole enterprise, see across time more, so a long-term horizon of where the CEO is trying to take the organization and see deeply into the, our own human dynamic and see consciously, so we're consciously aware of what's going on in us and others and the CEO, so we can navigate those fears and doubts and anxieties and the world view that says, you know, touch your shoulder, because that's a mindset right now, right? I adopted that mindset. So you're helping them see mindset in action. And so all that's critical. And so if we want to evolve ourselves as practitioners to have more of that access, the critical thing is we have to see what they don't see. Yeah. So we have to see more system dynamics. We have to see more process dynamics. We have to see more deeply into the human condition. And we have to evolve ourselves so we can be present with that powerful person who's always friggin' right and everybody knows it, and say when they're not. And say when they're not in a way that includes their thought process and their worldview, that leaves them feeling whole, and that has you maybe ruffle their feathers a little, and then tomorrow they call you back to say, would you explain that again? Right? And they call you back when you leave them with something compelling, when something strikes them that's on the edge of their awareness. But we don't go to the edge of the awareness when we got our head focused in tools. We got our head focused in tools. And I'm not saying anything we shouldn't do that. I'm saying as a profession, we've got to master that, get our standards together, and then we have, evolve, have to evolve. But those of you that have a tool set, my urging is to say, take that and do the work inside yourself. Do the personal work that evolves who you are as a human being so that you can become that trusted advisor because you see what they don't see. And you show up in a way where they love be, having you around just because it feels good, because you take them to a different place in themselves. It, it's, it's really a who you are and who you want to be as a professional question. And if I have attachment to being liked, being thought of as competent, keeping them all feeling comfortable so that they like me and like the work, then I tend to migrate to the, the lower level issues. If I have a self-identity that says I want to make a difference in the world, then I'm willing to ruffle some feathers. And what happens here in terms of our own growth as people and as professionals is, is the more I can manage my own fear, the more I can tell the truth to you. The more I can disclose what I'm really seeing and doing it, do it in a way that's authentic, that's without judgment, it's just what I see, it's my perspective, what's your perspective? 
And there's a level of neutrality that allows a dialogue that spins up the discourse to some breakthrough. But that only comes to the degree to which I have centered myself in a fundamental choice about my purpose in life, about making a bigger difference. And the more I find center in myself, the more I can see holes in the world, right? The more I see holes in the world, I don't mean holes, <laughs> I mean W-H-O-L-E-S, holes in the world, the more I find center. And so as I, as I migrate my life purpose to a higher and higher calling, I'm dropping myself deeper and deeper into myself. If I drop deeper and deeper into myself, I see how everything's connected and I naturally have a higher calling. And we say, why the hell are we talking about this in change management? Because in change management, as a practitioner, even if you've been in the field two years, you start to see maybe how this engagement of your group needs to be further upstream, right? That's a process thinking move. Or you see there needs to be a different discourse between the project management people and the change management people. Who's gonna stand for that? Who's gonna take that stand, right? So every day as a change manager, we have the opportunity to see something others don't see and voice it. And we'll only do that to the degree to which we've done the work inside, which is fundamentally that that determines where we go in our career. Because the trusted leaders want people that just give them the straight shot. I mean, I went, I'll give you another example. I went toe to toe with a hothead leader about two months ago on the phone, right? He's a CEO, big company, 130,000 people. And he started raise his energy and I started raise my energy. And I was totally conscious the whole time. So I've been working with him for about six months. And all of a sudden, we're going like this at each other on the phone, and yeah, and you're not seeing this and this, and then in the middle of the heat of it, I stop and go, and how's that for you? <laughs> and this calm thing goes, what do you mean? I said, does anybody ever do that to you? No. And then he pauses, and he goes, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting you try that and then call me a week later going, lost my job. I don't want to hear that. Right? But I know him, right? I know he's a hothead. And I've been nurturing, trying to get to him around his mindset in gentle ways, and boom, I had to do this. Now, had I done this out of my own fear and anxiety, I would have been totally, I would have been gone. But I did it from a place of conscious awareness, and so then I could just moderate where I was going in myself. And so that's where I think it grounds, Daryl, to the practitioner. We all have these opportunities. You know, we have to be in the game with our clients, so we have to have our trade, right? So pick your orientation to change, know the tools, know your method. We have to do that, so that's ground zero, right? We don't get in the game without that, right? And so as a, as a field, we've got to stabilize that, and we've got to get some agreement around standards, et cetera. And we just un need to understand that, that that's all great, 100% awesome, but partial. And so. I just ground this in an example. We were supporting a three-way merger once. Now just imagine that, three large companies doing this, right? Pretty crazy. The CEO, as this thing was coming together, basically got fired for some ethical conduct around money and pocket. The answer from the COO, who is now overnight the CEO, was, I said, What's, what, what do you think your strategy ought to be? You know, I was coaching these guys. They were using our change methodology. We're doing some leader development work, blah, blah, blah. So what do you think your strategy should be? So I entered with that listening mode. Right? Well, I think we ought to just pretend nothing happened, put out some memos, and about three months from now, everybody will forget about it. I went, oh, really? Way to go. <laughs> so I was in one of those moments, right? Do I try to nurture this, help him see? We've done some training with him, so I knew there were some models I could bring in. There were some experiences the gentleman had had, I could recall for him, and so there's some levers I could pull. And what I decided to do, just given who I knew he was, is I said, really, do you have any interest in me sharing with you my predictions? Yeah, sure. You're going in the ditch, dude, <laughs> right? And I just laid it on the line, boom, like this, okay? Really? So we navigated that conversation, got the executive team together later that afternoon, had the conversation openly and authentically. How many of you are scared to death? We're all scared to death. How many of you want to deal with that fear by running away? We all want to run away. We had that open conversation about the interior. Now, if we didn't have the open conversation about the interior, they would have done the CEO strategy, and they'd been in the ditch. So now that it's open, we have this conversation, we're all afraid, we don't know what to do. I said, do you guys trust us yet? Yeah, okay. Let's make some suggestions. Let's co-create a plan. 
Now here's where we got into change management. And we first kind of changed leadership and then dropped into some change management tools. Is what we decided to do is we need to put all the leaders in front of the entire organization over the next month. So they just basically got their second in commands to run operations and they were out doing road shows. And then we trained them for two days around how you catch arrows without them going in your chest. Right? So they had some communication, you know, what do you guys think about this screw up our ex-CEO and, and just, you know, get blasted by people being angry because it was all over the press, et cetera, et cetera. And so they went out and did that while we got the change management people together and made some incredible change strategies and, excuse me, communication strategies and communication plans. And it was because of the power of the change managers having those tools, having the ability to do stakeholder analysis and, and, you know, understand messages and history of different stakeholder groups and level of readiness and et cetera, et cetera, that we could then pinpoint the communication plans. And so it was a great example of how we never would have got even the good access and use of those change tools without having that interior conversation. We wouldn't have that interior conversation without the relationship. We wouldn't have had that without them having some access to their interior because they'd done some leader development coaching work. Right? And so you can see how that whole thing allows us as, as change managers to really excel in what we do. But we need the context. You can't grow the vegetable without tilling the soil, right? So we, we got to put all that in place as a field. When we start the relationship with whoever the client is at the C-suite, we contract for what's the breakthrough you're going for, what's the breakthrough I'm going for. How, how can I show up for you as a coach and a partner to support your breakthrough, here's how you can show up for me in my breakthrough. And so what that allows us to do is when we break down, we have a basis for a conversation to pick up the pieces and then spin it up into towards at least a breakthrough. And it's a really powerful frame. And I think it's, it's fundamental to what Daryl was saying earlier around we've got to work on our presence and our character. Because what I hear you saying is that your actual actions as a practitioner is your learning field for your own personal and professional development. And I couldn't agree with that more. And, and what's, what's really cool is taking that perspective and having that be my life perspective so that I'm actually living life so that all the trauma and the tribulation of my life actually is simply fodder for me to look inward and say, well, how am I showing up in relationship to this? And that's what we would you know, call conscious evolution. It's like I'm evolving consciously now. I'm using my life to, to work me over. So I'm changing <laughs> as a change agent. I do, like, I do like what you said about uh, making that explicitly part of, of the contract in place. So, so talking to potential customers and saying, okay, my challenge here is this one, what is yours? Yes. So uh, that's something I can try. Yeah, because we want to put each other on a level f playing field. We call it the quality of e equality, right? There's always a hierarchy, right? There's always going to be this vertical access. You know, they're the, they're the client, I'm the supplier, right? They're, that's the, their nature of hierarchy. But we can establish a quality of equality as human beings. I'm doing the best I can. You know, you're doing the best you can. We're going to screw up together because we're going outside the comfort zone and we're going to make magic happen here, so we're taking risks. So we're, by definition, we're going to fall on our face. So let's be brothers and sisters in that. That's the nature of the conversation. The thing for me is, will I allow myself to really feel the upset when I've screwed up? Or do I deny it and pretend it doesn't work and try to straighten myself up and carry on? Or do I let myself go into a puddle? Do I, if, I, if you haven't cried on the floor of your office or when you get home, you're not doing your job, right? right? And, and, and quite honestly, it's one of the, I think, challenges of us as a field at this stage is because we're trying to get it all lined up and standards and, you know, this and here's the articulation, here's how we interface with project management and here it's all organized and engineered and, but the bottom line, we're humans. And what we don't know how to do as humans is transform. We don't know, we don't do that very well, right? It's a slow process. It can go faster. And the fundamental thing that I think that we need to know how to do is to allow ourselves to feel what we feel. The nature of human beings is that we evolve. And then the question is, do we evolve, evolve consciously or not? You know, what we know, again, is there's only about 20% of the human population on the planet that actually pays attention to their interior in any real significant way. There's another about 30% 
to kind of glance in here every once in a while and notice they have a different set of feelings one day versus the other. But literally 50% of the population on planet Earth is pretty oblivious to what goes on inside their own psyche. You know, we're working with, with ourselves who we, each of us has room to grow, right? Every one of us. Next year, hopefully, we'll be wiser, smarter, see things differently. Same with our leaders. And so we're all in this, in this reality called complex change, and, and, and we're all over our heads. I mean, quite honestly, the complexity we're dealing with is complexity that the human race has never seen. And so by definition, it's, it's polishing, right? It's, it's honing us. And if we're in this direct relationship with it from a conscious evolution or a learning and growing and developing perspective, then every project we're on, we can take something back from. It might be the way I deployed my tools. It might be the way I communicated or didn't do very well with the other side, whatever it was, the project management team, the leader team, the mid-managers, the people in that other department. It might be something about how I knew early on an intuition that we had to go left, but I didn't say anything, and next time I'll be more sensitive to that intuition. You know, we'll take learning from different dimensions of who we are, and the bottom line is we'll grow, and, and we will succeed because success is just mile markers along our journey. I mean, that's for me, my perspective on it is that we will absolutely keep learning. And the more that we can do this kind of discourse, you know, together, where we can get real, as Daryl's um, suggesting, where we're not just puffing our chests and making sure everybody knows that we're all together and we know our stuff and we're so professional. And anybody notice that in the room at all? Can we call it out? All right, raise your hand if you've had any energy about making sure you look good sometime in this conference. Raise your hand. Come on, you liars! Ah! Yeah, so it goes on for all of us. And so the other side is raise your hand if you're open to show your warts and your scars. Yeah, so now we get real, right? If we're willing to go on both sides about how wonderful we are and how we still have learning to do, then we can be a really powerful community. When I say we're going to be successful, I'm actually not necessarily talking about us as a field. I'm talking mm -hmm. about us as a race, you know, us as a group of people who are looking to how we navigate and transform organizations. This field, if it doesn't evolve, will go away, right? And something else will replace it. And it might be some hybrid combination between OD and leader development and executive coaching and strategy and et cetera, right? But there's a need that needs to be fulfilled. And that need, I think, we've articulated here around dealing deeper with humans, dealing more with the process orientation, more strategic, seeing systems more widely. That, we're going to succeed at that. We'll figure that out. Now, whether we do as a field, I don't know. It's an interesting question. Where I find hope, though, is in the last three or four years, we've seen this radical increase in the request for advanced conscious change leader development, where we didn't have that request even going five years back at the scale that we do now. And so there's lots and lots of executives, since that's mostly our, our clientele, that are saying we have a change management department, but it's not enough. And that question ought to scare us and excite us. It should excite us that there's a department now. It should scare us that we're not meeting the full need. And I think that's the tension that, as an industry, we've got to hold. And so I think we can meet that need, but I think we've got to press our edge, is what Daryl is talking about, is we need to turn into where we don't yet have it together and explore that. And if we do that, then this field will be incredible 20 years from now. And if we don't, this field may not exist 20 years from now. Because the complexity our leaders are facing is so huge, they need the solution. And it's going to be some integration across these disciplines. And how that shows up operationally is yet to be seen. I just hope I'm around to see it because I'm real excited about it. <laughs> you know, a lot of our core work is we make this promise that you'll get to the client, that you'll get breakthrough project and enterprise change initiative results while simultaneously building capability. And, and what the request is on that side often migrates to looking at the integration of these different disciplines. And so I think it's going to end up, quite honestly, um, making you know, a bold guess today, is we're going to see more and more strategic change offices. And that strategic change office, my wish is there's actually a, a chief change office, officer, a CCO. 
Just like not too many years ago, there wasn't a CIO. Now there is, right? It wasn't that many years before, by the way, that HR EVPs weren't EVPs, they were SVPs or VPs, and they weren't at the executive table. So now you have people at the executive table, you have technology, but what's coming forth next is change. And the reason change has to be at the executive table is because change is strategy execution. And so what ends up happening is those smart people at the top get all these great ideas about what the market and the customer needs. They launch all these change efforts without ever thinking about capacity, right? So our research shows the number one issue now in organizations is capacity, right? Because there's all this operational stuff and all this change efforts and, and the same resources, no one's you know, really took a strategic view of how to do it. So what happens is those change efforts are set up for failure right from the beginning because they don't have staff, they don't have resources. And they don't have integration planning and all that. That has to start when you actually launch a change effort, not after customer requirements are designed or during impact analysis or something. It has to start there at the C-suite. So the chain, chief change officer has to say, we got no capacity. And then somebody says, well, what can we stop? What can we delay? What can we modify? What can we integrate to get more done with less resources. That has to happen at the C-suite. So I see a, a, a um, strategic change office led by a chief change officer. Inside that will live program project management, change management, OD, and all kinds of other support functions. Now, immediately you begin to think, well, that's a giant hierarchy. It doesn't need to be that way. It can be one person with a couple staff people. And what that person has command of, of all those resources that might live in the line. So your OD people, your change management people might be hooked to line organizations, but it's a matrix um, function so that the executive strategic brain of the organization can use those resources in the most efficient way. I think it's, it sums up in realizing that change starts with us and taking on a journey very proactively, very passionately, um, around our personal and our, and our professional development. And our personal development w would include learning about our style and learning about our typical behaviors and our emotional patterns and then going deeper in ourselves and fundamentally ending up with some internal practice that keeps evolving ourselves from the inside out so that we bring more of our being to, to, to the game and to what we do. And, you know, including things like meditation, and, you know, all kinds of forms of personal growth, the more we can do on the personal side. Because that translates into better skills to build relationship and community. It translates to deeper listening, more authentic speaking. It translates to understanding human motivation and how people's worldviews actually determine whether they're resistant or commitment to our change efforts. So it gives us insight to the to the things we're actually working with called humans, right? called people, because I'm my, I'm my best laboratory for that. So that's one side, personal development. On the professional development, it's to stretch the boundaries. You know, and if your boundary right now, because you're new to the field, is to learn the basics, then learn the basics. But let's not stagnate there. Let's go to the edges. So what, what do you already feel your strength is and where is your weakness? So maybe you're really good on the human side, but you're not so good on the system side. Or maybe you're really good at the tactical level of process, but you're not really good at the strategic level of process. Maybe your worldview tends to be in, in month increments, but well, what if you could get it year increments? So f for me then, what that translates to is to stretch the boundaries and look outside our discipline. But to go out into those other disciplines, into, the, into those worlds from the perspective of what can I bring back to my field as a change practitioner. And that, for me, is the most important thing, because if we embrace change for ourselves, then we're going to bring more of our capabilities to our clients.